And so I'm going to kick off this morning's uh, session in regards to my topic. I'm going to get into that, but I want to go over some, uh, some information here regarding the topic that I'm going to be speaking about. We know that over the years, uh, generations have been given names. You know, you hear of, you know, you hear of, you know, maybe the most famous name, you know, the baby boomers, right? Isn't that, you know, a, a famous name that's given to um, a, you know, group of, of, of individuals born during certain years? Uh, we have, you know, millennials. How many are, are aware of millennials? I didn't hear that much cheering for millennials. <laughs> I wanted to go over some of these generations that have went on over the years and starting with all the way back to 1925. Anyone born in 1925? No. <laughs> 1925 through the year 1945 is considered the silent generation. This generation lived through the McCarthy era when the fear of communism swept through the country. These individuals would be currently ages 78 to 98. Next, as I mentioned earlier, are baby boomers. The ages or the year of 1946 to 1964. This generation was, in, uh, was integral in and present for many of the technology advances over the past 50 years. This group is the ages of 59 to 77 currently. Next is Gen X. 19, there we go, a lot of Gen X here, huh? all right? Or just one really excited Gen X. <laughs> you did it. Gen X, 1965 to 1979. They were present for the inception of the internet, video games, artificial intelligence, and is the population that has created many of these advances. Their ages, 44 to 58. Then you have Gen Y, AKA millennials. Woo! The year is 1980 to 1994. I can't tell you how many arguments I have with people that I am really part of Gen X, although my age doesn't tell it, but I am part of Gen X. Gen Y, the millennials, 1980, 1994. This generation grew up in the times of 9-11. They remember when Amazon only sold books. <laughs> This was also the generation, the first generation, to know a childhood both with and without the internet. Ages 29 to 43. Yes, I am in that category. Don't judge me. Next we have Gen Z. There we go. 1995 to 2012, this group has been exposed to social media and the first population to deal with cyberbullying. Remember when, you know, bullying was face-to-face, -face, right? You know, maybe, you know, face the toilet. <laughs> They're dealing with cyberbullying and other internet-related issues. It was also during this time that school-related violence and climate crisis have become more prevalent. This generation also spent their adolescent and young adult years living through COVID-19. And, and then there was what they call the greatest generation. That was 1981. And just that one year. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's when I was born. The greatest generation, 1901 to 1924. This generation lived through the Great Depression and also fought in World War II. 
Their ages, 99 to 122. The, the greatest generation was given that name because of their resilient spirit. They overcame, they got through many of our nation's toughest times that we've ever seen. These times that would either make or break you, they got through it, they persevered. See, these generations are usually grouped together in around 20 to 30 year intervals. You see, what is important here is that they were given names based upon what they went through during their adolescent and during their young adult years. Why is that important? Because it's during those years, your adolescent years, you know, 10 and up, and then through your young adult years, 18 to 30, is when the things around you the situations and circumstances that you go through end up shaping your life. And this is what took place with all these generations. I gave to you information of all the things that these, not all the things, but some of the things that these generations had to go through during those years of their lives. And it shaped them. It sort of made them who they are today. You know, we know that, you know, knowing God and have a having a relationship with God has further changed our lives, right? It's, it's changed those, those wrong thinkings, those, those wrong, uh, you know, that may, uh, change that wrong hearts, the wrong motives. And it changed us around. But still, the things that we grew up in made us who we are today, in a sense, how we treat people, how we react to things, how we handle stressful environments. Those in the greatest generation handled much stress. They had to get through tough times. There was times when, when they didn't have much, but they got through it. And it made them who they are. And this is what I want to get through today. I titled this message, The Greatest Generation, with an emphasis on working with youth and young adults. We see that experiences, circumstances, how they shape our lives there's so many things that our generations have went through over the years and all these different things that we've seen come and go or maybe you've seen you know come and go and then come back again you've seen all these trends you've seen all these all these processes of 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 fads and 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 interest and you think, oh, what is next? What's next for our generation? I want to look at a few areas here this morning with you in regards to how God, what God wants from us, how God wants us to invest, how, what, what our circumstances that we have been through you know, we find many different generations here this morning. So many, so many uh, uh, different experiences that we have gone through in our lives. I don't believe any one of us is the same in regards to every circumstance that we have gone through. Yes, there may be, there may be some similarities, but none of us is the exact same. We've all had, we all have our things that we've overcome in our lives. And this is what God wants to use. This is what God wants to use from your life to teach others. To get them ready, first point being is to equip. Write that down, equip. See, this generation, 
When I talk about this, let's, let's focus on, on our youth, uh, young adults, you know, the, the adolescent years, the young adult years. This generation, we know, lacks genuine relationships. And I, off of what Pastor Jose was talking about with genuine fellowship, you know, I feel that this generation lacks genuine relationships. Why? Because most of their relationships are virtual. They're maintained through social media. They're maintained through the use of cell phones, texting, uh, uh, and, and all these kind of things. Things that we didn't have while we were growing up. But this is their way of building and keeping relationships. It's very different than other generations. But you and I need to teach them to build genuine relationships. Genuine. I believe that over these past few years during COVID, that I believe this generation, our youngsters, I believe even they reached their max in regards to being isolated. See, this is a generation that can handle, they can handle virtual relationships. You and I can't do that, maybe. I'm not sure, you know, what generation group you fall into, but maybe you are unable to, to keep relationships genuine over, uh, 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 over, you know, social media or the internet. But this generation can do that, and they, and they, and they seem to, 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 to enjoy that. But I believe even during these COVID years that this generation met its match. Because although they're not accustomed to that face-to-face -face interaction as many are, it still was too much. And I believe that it showed this generation the need for it. I believe that God, you know, I mean, how many believe that God uses everything for good? Do you believe that? Because it'll help us, it'll help us in the way that we talk about things. If we actually believe that God uses everything for our good. And I believe that God was, that God has used these past few years in many things, but one of those things is showing this generation that, hey, you need genuine relationships. This isolation stuff is a killer. You can't build relationships without interaction. They found, their, they found themselves spending crucial growth years in their lives. Many high schoolers, you know, juniors, seniors, spending those crucial growth years of their lives in isolation. Can you imagine that? I can't imagine that. I can't imagine what that felt like. I can't imagine the, the, just the, the, um, just the, the feeling of get me out of here. I need some interaction. This is not cool. I know I have my phone, but this is not enough. I need more. I need some contact. <laughs> it's like I'm living on Mars or something. And I believe they reached their max. But I believe God is opening their eyes to exactly that point, the need for it. And I believe that God is changing the atmosphere in their lives. That God is changing their perspective on relationships. To open their lives, to uh, allow others to speak into their lives, to invest. See, it was a genuine relationship that Paul had with Timothy. Paul encouraged Timothy to focus on three spiritual priorities of the ministry. Number one, 
being nourishment from God's word. Second Timothy 3, verse 16, Paul says these words in the Amplified Version. It says it like this. It says, all scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error, and restoration to obedience. See, this generation knows God's word. They've been raised in it. They've been raised in it. You think of those, you think of those, those uh, uh, the, the, the Gen Z's, ages of 11 to 28. 11 to 28. And that's who I'm focusing on this morning, our Gen Z's. They know God's word. They were raised in it. They had to memorize memory verses uh, to get stamps and candy. I'm telling you, when you throw rewards into memorizing God's word, the, your kids are going to memorize God's word. <laughs> we as parents should do that at home. You know, you could have an ice cream if you read this chapter in the Bible. I tell you right now, they will read that Bible faster than you ever will. <laughs> you throw some ice cream in the mix, it's a game changer. Although they know God's word, they need to see God's word in action in our lives. They need to see what God's word looks like when it's lived. God's word in action. In our prayer lives, they need to see God's word in action. In our ability to trust God in times of need, they see what's happening in the house. They see what's happening in the church. Believe me, those 11 to 28 year olds, they're seeing, they're, they're watchful in regards to what their leader is doing. How their leader is reacting to things. They're watching what their parents do in these times. And they're watching and they're looking for us. They're looking for us to be that example of God's word to them. See, we need to pray that God shows us what they need. God, help me to understand our youth. How many of you have prayed that? Lord, help me to understand them. Lord, I don't, I don't want to be the one that sits back and complains about how everything has changed. Lord, help me to understand them. Help me to be that person that can invest in them. Because if not you, then who? Who's going to do it? God built a beautiful church here with beautiful people. With beautiful youth and young adults ready, ready and willing to take God's word and put it into action. To take all that you have invested in them and run with it. They're ready. They're ready. But we need God to help us to understand them so that we can properly reach them and keep them. Yes, they may do some things different. They may, they may think different. But God has equipped you to still have an impact in their lives. God has still equipped you to train them. God has still equipped you to point them in the right direction. Which brings us to the next point. Not only did Paul stress the nourishment from God's word to young Timothy, but he also, the training in godliness. 2 Timothy 3.16, as it continues, Paul says, God's word is for training in righteousness. Learning to live in conformity to God's will. 
both publicly and privately. Mm. Behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, Paul was telling Timothy that God's word has everything you need to live a life that pleases God. It's got everything you need. It's the instructions for you to live a life that pleases God. How many of you have policy and procedures at your job? Raise your hand if you do. Come on. You have policy and procedures at your job. Maybe in the form of HR. Everyone does, right? Everyone has those policies and procedures. Things you can and can't do, right? Mostly things you can't do. It doesn't say things you can do. It says things you can't do. But there are rules for what? To keep you out of trouble and to keep you with a job. If you want to keep your job, then you need to follow these rules. Paul says to Timothy, if you want to remain in Christ then you need to follow God's rules. We do it so willingly at our jobs, but when it comes to following God's word, it's like we think it's an option. God help us when we think that we can just say no to it and get away with it. See, God's word is there for a reason. It's to keep us from harm is to keep us from death, eternal death. That's why Paul was telling Timothy, hold on to God's word. We need to train them in godliness through his word. And all the things that we've learned, what God has taught us in the training in godliness, be slow to speak, quick to listen. How many of you have a hard time following that one? (laughs) That's a tough one. You know, you you might do good one time, but then something else comes up, and then boom, you failed. Be slow to speak and quick to listen. How about the importance of obedience and the blessings of it? Because we can just preach obedience, you know, be obedient, be obedient, be obedient, but I tell you right now, you're going to lose our Gen Z's. If you, if you just preach about obedience. But talk about the blessings of it. Talk about the rewards of obedience. What God will do for them. That God is going to, that God is going to give them a, a, a full and enriching life. A lasting life. That if they're obedient to their parents, I believe that it's going to show in their kids as well. Their kids will be obedient to them. How many of you want obedient kids? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for obedience. (laughs) You know, when we have to do it, it's, it's another thing, but we want our kids to be obedient to us. How about we demonstrate it first? Hallelujah. Starting with me first. Let's, let's be an example of obedience to those that God has placed over our lives. The importance of integrity. The importance of, of you know, one of those things of integrity is, 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 you know, when no one's around. What are you doing? Are you mindful of your actions? Because God is always there. God is is always with us, right? We don't want to hurt him. We want to be obedient to him. He loves us. Yes, he does, and he will always love us. But we need to reciprocate in that. God, I love you. God, and I love you in my actions. I love you so much that I will not allow these things into my body into my lives, into my mind, into my heart. 
We must, te we must teach them not to fear what the world thinks, but instead to focus on honoring God. Honor God in your life. Paul also stressed the importance to Timothy of being mission-minded. What does that mean, seeing beyond our own lives? Because I may know that we can get focused on ourselves. I won't say we'll get stuck on stupid because I'm not calling anyone stupid here. That's not what I'm saying. But we can get stuck on ourselves. We can. We can start, we can start, because this is, this is the, these, these are those times when we, when, when we just start, like, you know, just thinking crazy. Because we're thinking about ourselves. And we start getting stressed out, we start worrying because we're thinking about ourselves. But when we think about others, oh, I can't think of the last time that when I was thinking about others that I was getting stressed out. Or I was like really, really worried. Like, oh my gosh, how is this going to get done when you're just focusing on other people, when you're focusing on serving? But when you focus on your own self, I'm telling you right now, you're going to be a mess. And so we need to teach them to go beyond their own lives. Because how many know this generation can do that as well, just like we do? They can get stuck on themselves. And so you and I need to teach them and remind them to have a heart for people. That at church here, they can have a heart for people. They don't even have to, they don't even have to just be in their age group, but to reach out to those that they see here to say hi, to get out of that comfort zone, to show someone God's love. Be mission-minded. It all starts here. Before we take it out to the rest of the world, it needs to start here, amen? <laughs> That's why the Bible says to get your own home in order first. <laughs> Get your, get your own life in order first before you start trying to give it to someone else. It all starts here. God is building. He's building, building, building here. He's doing it. I see it in their lives. I see, I see a difference in this generation. I truly truly do. I'm not just saying that. I see a difference in them. It's a difference. You know, it, it, it reminds me of, of when I was growing up in church and, 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 you know, so many of us just wanted to serve. You know, we were, we were in those youth years. We were in those young adult years, and we just wanted to serve. We just wanted to serve. So many people in here that, are, that were in that age group that I can name, but I don't want to miss anyone. But you know who you are. There was always those outreaches. There was always the drama teams. There was, there was you know, we had like 15 bands going during that time. Every, every, uh, 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 every type of music you could think of, we had it. Why? Because people were just eager to serve. You know, it blessed me last night to see our youth play for offering. But what you didn't know was that they didn't know that they were playing for altar call. <laughs> There's so many things that you guys don't even know what takes place, like with all the changes and things like that. They didn't know they were playing for altar call but they were voluntold, <laughs> and they did it. They did it. They did it. There wasn't any griping. Not one of them came to me or pastor after and said, you know what, I don't really like that. <laughs> I don't really like how you threw that on us last minute. <laughs> they didn't do that. They just said yes. They just did it. That's what we need. See, and these are practical things that you and I can do. Gen Zs, these are practical things that you guys have done because you did it last night. And allow God to continue that in your life because you may ask those questions, well, how do I do this, pastor? That's how you do it. 
Let that be a, a stepping stone for you for the next time. Because who knows what that next time is going to demand of you. But just say yes. Be mission-minded. Not only do we need to equip them, but we need to empower them. Empower, write that down, empower. The four-minute mile was broken in 1954 by a man named Roger Bannister. What an amazing feat it was. Running a four-minute mile means that you're running at a speed of 15 miles per hour. 15 miles an hour. That's fast for a human. But what caught my attention regarding this record that was achieved that day was this. Although that record stood all the way until 1954, no one could beat that four-minute mile. And I'm sure, I'm not counting the 1700s because no one was keeping track of this back then. Right? This is pretty like, you know, 1900, you know, and on, kind of, sort of, when people were actually, you know, jotting these things down and keeping record of it. But let's say from 1900 to 1954, no one can beat the four-minute mile. And then all of a sudden in 1954, a man named Roger beats this four-minute mile. What amazed me was that, do you know how long it took for someone to beat Roger Bannister's record? After 54 years, we'll just put 54 years, right? 1900 to 1954. After 54 years, no one could beat that record, but in only 46 days, someone beat his record. What happened? Can anyone answer that? What changed? Can anyone answer that? I'm waiting for an answer. What changed? They believed it can be done. Wow. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Think about that. Think about that for a second. Because in 54 years, what took 54 years to do, no one else had did it only took 46 days for someone else to beat that. Why? Because they believed they could. They saw someone else do it. Church, this, genera- this next generation is watching you. What you say is impossible, guess what? is going to stay impossible for them. The obstacles that you don't overcome, guess what? They may not overcome them as well. I didn't say they will not. I said they may not. Don't misconstrue my words. They may not overcome those things because you have not shown them. Church, This generation needs you and I to show them. To show them that with God, all things are possible. They need to see it. And I'll tell you right now, when they see that and believe it, oh my goodness, they're they're going to, they're going to take that full force. The article says that as as of June 2022, that now over 1,700 athletes have now broken the the four-minute mile. Why? Because someone else did. Oh, if he can do it, I can do it. Are you with me? If he can do it, if she can do it, I can do it. And this is what they're going to be running with. And this is what's going to propel them, I believe. How many things have you overcome in your life that others said would be impossible? 
God wants to use that. He wants to use that. I'm in a room with individuals who are miracles, just straight up miracles. You shouldn't be here today. We shouldn't be here today, but by God's grace, you find yourself here. You made it a point. You didn't just find yourself here. It wasn't an accident. I shouldn't say that. You made it a point to be here this morning. I'll never forget Paul's words because this is a scripture that has propelled me uh, in my endeavors in my life. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I want you to say all things. I can do all things. And this is what really, really set my path. It continues, it continues to set my path in my walk with Christ. Is that I can do all things through Christ, not through Daniel, not through my, my whatever giftings or talents that I may have, I don't know. But it's through Christ. I can do all things when Christ gives me the strength to do it. I tell you right now, when you, when you believe that, I'm telling you, it's the possibilities are endless. When our youth and our young adults understand that anything is possible with God, we're going to see a boldness like never before. You're going to see courage like you've never seen before. They will rise up like that mighty army of godly warriors that God has raised them to be. I believe this is why our youth and our young adults would do far greater things than we ever do in our lives. I believe that. That's the way it's supposed to be. Don't feel... Don't be offended by others doing more than you <laughs> that you've raised. No, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to get better and better. We're supposed to reach more and more. We're supposed to get closer to God and closer to God and closer to God. We're supposed to do that. Not only have they overcome their own battles in life, but they have seen you and I overcome. And they need to see you and I keep overcoming. Oh, you keep persevering. You keep pressing forward. I don't know, I don't know what's taking place in your life right now or what the enemy's lying to you about right now, but you need, to, you, need to, you need to tune him out and allow God to speak into your life right now because if you're feeling defeated, if you're feeling confused, that is not from God, amen? That's from the lying devil, and you need to, you need to resist those words, and you need to, you need to be, be mindful and attentive to God's voice. We need to equip, empower, and lastly here is to employ. Employ. What a blessed thing when your kid gets a job, right? <laughs> Man, I'm telling you. Hallelujah. Employ. Us adults like that word when it comes to the next generation, right? Yes. Employ them. Employ them all, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> to employ means to give work to, right? To give work to, to put into action. The greatest generation, those born between 1901 and 1924, were given that name once again because of their resilient spirit. Because of the things that they got... Uh, overcame and, and went through and, 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 and came out victorious. But just like last night, we need our youth to 
employ. We need our young adults to employ. We need to give work to. We need to allow them to be who God has called them to be. I can't wait. I can't wait to hear to hear our our you know the 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 next uh, uh, Gen Z uh, speakers for God, the next leaders for God, the next nursery workers, Royal Ranger commanders, impact leaders, care team leaders. I was going to say 50 plus, but you got to be a certain age for that. So I'll stop, I'll stop right there. You guys can't oversee 50 plus yet. All right? <laughs> I know you want to. They throw, they throw amazing parties, but, you know, not yet. <laughs> Let me get there first. <laughs> wow, that's coming up. All right, so, yes, back to God's word. <laughs> Don't think about self, Daniel. <laughs> I believe this generation wants something more. I don't mean that what they have right now is not good. It's not what I mean. But they want something more. They want more. How many, you know, in, in your job, you know, you want more, don't you? Is that a bad thing? No, that's a good thing. You want more. I want, I want more money, right? Isn't that what you want? More money, not more time at work. <laughs> I want more money. I believe this generation wants more. I believe there's a hunger to see God work through their lives. I believe it. I believe they're willing to allow God to use their lives. You and I will make sure that they are ready. Amen? Yes? You and I will make sure that they have all the tools to succeed. You and I will make sure that when they... That when they uh, 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 go on their journey in serving Christ and they meet those impossible situations that you will encourage them and, 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 and walk them through it. We're going to do this together. We're going to do this together. I know, I know you may think it looks impossible, but with God, all things are possible. We're going to get through it together. We're going to get through it together. We're going to beat this four-minute mile but you have to believe it. They must believe that God's true to his word. How do they believe that? By experiences. By experiences. The most faith building times in my lives or in my lives in my life how many lives did i have <laughs> the most faith building times in my life um, were my experiences yes the things that i was told was really great the words of encouragement and, and, and wisdom and all those good nuggets, I am not counting that out. But what meant the most in my life was my personal experiences. And this is what they will experience as they continue to trust God. As they continue to take God at his word. Their faith will continue to be strengthened as they continue to step out in faith to allow God to further solidify the fact that he is trustworthy. You and I know that, right? We know that for a fact, but they need to know that. 
that he is trustworthy. Psalm 145, as I close this morning, Psalm 145, and the whole chapter is really good, so I put it up there at 121. You could just read the whole chapter when you have time, especially our next generation, our Gen Z's here this morning, 11 to 28 years old. Read that, Psalm 145, when you have a chance. A couple of verses here, beginning in verse 1, it says, David writes this. He says, I will exalt you. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. I like the sandlot. Forever. Great is the Lord, he says. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. In verse 13 it says, For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. God rules throughout all generations. It doesn't matter what generation you grew up in, we serve the same God. We serve the same God. The God who created the heavens and the earth, that's the God that we serve. He's the one and only God. And for you, next generation, you, you shall not worship any other gods but the one and only. The one and only he deserves your praise. And never ever forget this, next generation. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. This is for the next generation here. Generation 610. The Lord your God, this is what the Lord spoke to Moses. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Check this out. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig. And you will eat from vineyards, from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and serve him and only him. I want you to understand this, next generation. Don't ever forget. Don't ever forget wherever you are in this building. I see a group back here. Don't ever forget who did the groundwork. Because I'm telling you right now, God is going to bless you. God is going to bless you. How? Through the work that others have done. <laughs> Through the sacrifices that your pastors have made. The leaders in this church. Your parents. Your grandparents and their parents that have prayed for you, that have spent hours just in tears about the next generations to come. God, save them. God, use them. God, I pray that none of them, that none of them are lost. All those prayers, this beautiful building we're in this morning, all the sacrifices that were made, all the investment that was made for you to partake of what you get to partake of today. Don't ever forget that because that's very key. That's very key to not become entitled. It's very key. This entitlement mentality 
it, that's, a, that's a virus. It's a disease. We need to get rid of that. You need to always remember that what you have was built by someone else, was worked on by some, with someone else's hands, was prayed into existence. You're here because of someone else. Yes, you're here because of God, but you're here too because of the prayers, the prayers of the righteous. Don't ever forget that, and I want you to run with that. Why? Because you need to pray for your next generation. This is key, because if you want to see your kids do things for God, then you need to do exactly what was done in order for you to be here. You need to do exactly, take the, take the steps that were taken, hold on to those truths, as Paul tells Timothy, if you want to see the next generation do even greater things. And I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to be blessed for it. You're going to be blessed for it. All those sacrifices you make is not in vain. All those decisions you make to choose righteousness and to say no to the things of the world, God will honor those. He's going to honor that not only in your life, but in the generations to come. So you remember that as you are obedient to God's word and you trust in his word because he is good. God is always good, always. And God help us to encourage them, to equip them, to empower them, and to employ them. We're gonna see God continue to do great things like never before, like never before. And I believe God is creating another greatest generation. I believe it. I believe it. But with God's help, amen. Let's give God praise.